like tomorrow night at 6.30 here at Christ Central Church, we're going to be having a miracle healing service. How many believe in miracles? <coughs> so if you know anybody that needs a healing or needs a miracle, then come join us and we're going to trust God or look to God to uh, maybe do some miracles uh, tomorrow night. Amen? Amen. So, Alright, we've been on our new study. The Holy Spirit, we've finished our course on discipleship, and now that we are signed up as disciples, there's some things that we need to know, that we need to know, and one of the things that we need to know first is that God is trying you. I mean, we have God the Father. God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three different perspectives, three different aspects, three different roles, functions, but it's all the same God. That's why when we baptize, we like to baptize in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Kind of hit all three of them. So our study is going to be taking a look at this. We know God is. Our Father and the Son is there for several reasons, uh, for salvation and also to intercede for us. But uh, our study is going to be taking a look at this Holy Spirit. And what are the things that we need to know about the Holy Spirit? So turn me to Acts chapter 2, 38 and 39. After Pentecost, Peter goes into a long sermon and begins to educate the people how they missed it when it came to Jesus, that he was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and how they nailed him to the cross. And basically, after the message, it says they were cut to the quick means their heart was stung. They were convicted. And they said, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, which means to change your mind, change your attitude and the direction going in and, and go in the direction and get lined up with God is what repentance means. Get on the same page with, uh, with God. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise of this Holy Spirit is for you, your children, and all who are far off, and as many that will call upon the name of the Lord. We know because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, basically the very moment Immediately when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, uh, that the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's a gift because a gift is not something you earn or something you deserve, it's simply something that was given as a, as a byproduct of salvation. We were given or imputed uh, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit now lives inside of our heart. Some have said, to kind of help you understand it, like I said last week, is if you were to uh, get saved and immediately step on a scale and then you got saved, that immediately you'd gain weight, just to kind of help you understand. I mean, something actually happens when we get born again. I mean, the, the Spirit of God comes and lives inside of us and it takes up permanent residence and now there's this seed that's growing and You've been impregnated, and it's producing things, it's doing things, and, uh, you know, it uh, is there for us, and it's a, a gift. So, things we need to know about this gift, one is that we need to be educated about the Holy Spirit. When Paul went to Ephesus, he went down and said, did you receive the Holy Spirit? 
when you believe, they said, well, man, I, you know, we've not even heard of the Holy Spirit. They were saved. So they had to have the Holy Spirit living inside them, but they had never received the Holy Spirit. They had it, but they weren't aware of it. You know, they probably knew they were different, but they couldn't put their finger on what's changed. And they probably have repented. They turned around, and now they're saved. And so Paul happens to show up at the same time. He says, well, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said, well, we don't even know there's a Holy Spirit. So first, before he could educate them on receiving, he had to educate them on who the Holy Spirit was, most likely. And so it's the same with us today. People, you know, maybe they get saved and they might not even really know about the Holy Spirit. They hear about it, but they've never really become educated. So one of the things we want to do in our study here is we want to begin to educate and learn about the Holy Spirit. The other thing is that, you know, we have to receive the Holy Spirit. He said that uh, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The word receive is our word labamba, labana. It means to take something or to take hold of it or to seize, to seize it, to, to take possession of it, to make it your own, to take ownership of it. I can have this gift, you know, sitting out there in the UPS truck and the little man in the little brown outfit runs in and hands it and I sign for it and there now I've received the gift. I have this gift. He's gone. He's doing his own thing. I've received the gift and I have the gift, but, but I may not take an ownership of it. You know, this, this thing is a gift, but until I receive it and I open it up and take the gift out and whatever the gift is and use the gift, suppose it was a nice chainsaw or something or a fishing pole or whatever, I mean, it could be sitting in a nice box, but until I pull the chainsaw out and crank it up and make it my own and I get out and start appropriating the gift that God's given me, then, then it's just a gift. So we can have this gift of the Holy Spirit. It's undeserved, unmerited, and we can have the Holy Spirit live inside of us, but, but we may not understand how it works, and we may have not yet received it. We may not have dove into the Holy Spirit and pulled the Holy Spirit out of the box and taken use and then appropriated the Holy Spirit. People can... I can invite everybody over for a uh, dinner party. I can be in the back room in the den and the guests are in the house. But until I walk out of there and I actually go out and greet or receive my guests, then it's a whole different thing. So I can have guests in my house. I can have the Holy Spirit living inside of me. But until I to learn to uh, understand the Holy Spirit and receive the Holy Spirit and begin to apply it and appropriate and make use of that, then it's just simply a gift. So we're going to learn how to, you know, about the Holy Spirit. We're going to learn how to receive the Holy Spirit, how to begin to appropriate it and make use of the different things that He's done in our life. So the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, He has a role to play. He has a job. Different aspects, different functions, different purposes, different responsibility areas that He has a job. And so we're going to kind of take the Holy Spirit out here. We're going to blow it up. And we're going to take a look at just what are these roles and responsibilities and aspects of the Holy Spirit. Now last week we talked about the Holy Spirit part one. Turn with me to Acts 1.8. He said the first role that we need to know of the Holy Spirit is that He is there to empower us. After the disciples had turned coward and they abandoned Jesus and left Him hanging on the cross, He was resurrected, told Him to go wait. Uh, 
up into uh, to go into Jerusalem, and uh, in verse one eight, he says, "But you will receive." There's our word again, Labama. You will take hold. You will appropriate. You will begin to apply, uh, and you will receive power when this Holy Spirit comes upon you, or when this Holy Spirit comes and begins to live inside of you. You're going to receive power. And it's going to make you my witnesses. The word witnesses is the word martyr. It says it's going to make you so bold, so confident to the point that you're willing to be martyred. We know when they, when Peter was uh, challenged about whether he knew Christ, he denied him. He said, oh, I'll follow thee, I'll never deny you. And the Lord said, well, before the night's over, before the rooster crows, three times you're going to, you're, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And sure enough, he turned coward and he ran. So, so now Jesus is aware that these disciples are, are going to need some power. You know, they, they didn't have power. They were they were lacked confidence. They lacked boldness. They turned coward and they ran. And he was going to need these very disciples now to go and to carry on the message and change the whole world. So something need to 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 happen to them. Something needs to change. And so. He says, go and wait and you will receive power. The word power is the word dunamis. It's the word for might or ability. It's where we get our modern day word for dynamite. It means a supernatural dynamite power. How many know we can't live the Christian life without power? You know, all the three steps were we, we admitted finally that we were powerless over the effects of our separation from God and our lives become manageable. Notice it doesn't say we admit we're powers over alcohol or drugs. I like our step. It's much better. It says we finally admitted that we were powerless over the effects of our separation from God. Our problem is not drugs and alcohol. Our problem is a God problem. God created us to serve Him, to have fellowship with Him like Adam and Eve, but Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They went their own way and sinned and entered into the world. They were separated from God. So our problem now is the fact that we've been separated from God and we need to be restored back to God. So the first thing, you know, to getting off drugs and alcohol is that we've got to be reconnected. So it says here, we came out of denial and we finally admitted that we were powerless over the effects of being separated from God. Every single time we run on our own and do what we need to do, we get off the drugs and alcohol, and then our lives become unmanageable. So we finally had to, to come to a place where we realized that we were powerless over alcohol and drugs and over being separated from God that every single time we go insane. We, we do crazy things. And so now, I don't know about you, but I've identified my higher power as, as the, the power greater than myself is, is uh, the Holy Spirit. That's who I identify as my higher power. He is the power. He, he is, is the one that came and began to do for me what I was unable to do for myself. He took me from being powerless and He began to empower me. He made me brave. He's given me confidence and boldness. He's given me His grace. Grace is a type of Holy Ghost empowerment that does for us what we can't do for ourselves. It enables me when I'm incapable. It makes me capable. It allows me to bear up manfully. It gives me the ability to, to bear up manfully, to have a Christ-like character when crisis comes into my life. It empowers me when I feel powerless. When that thing gets on me and I want to drink or I want to drug or you know the, the different sexual temptations or whatever we deal for, when I'm, when I'm powerless, first thing I need to do is to drop to my knees and turn to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I need some power. I need an infusion. I need you to energize me. I need you to motivate me. I'm, I'm getting ready to, to blow it. So this is where we turn to our real sponsor. We don't just call our sponsor and call numbers. We do that too. But ultimately we call upon the name of our higher power, Jesus Christ. And He now He steps aside. He begins to rise up and empower us. Pushes us up over that tips of temptation. And pushes us over the edge. And, and so this is one of the first reasons we have the Holy Spirit is He empowers us. He's our helper, John 14, 16. Our great scripture on the role of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, 
talking to his disciples and he's talking about, hey, I'm, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be up in heaven. I'll be sitting at the right hand of the Father. He said, but before I leave or when I leave, I'm going to ask the Father and He's going to give you a, another helper that He may be with you forever. So this Holy Spirit that lives inside of us now is there to be our helper. We can't live the Christian life without help. We used to start this meeting at Overcomers. When I first got out of Duncan, I first came to Overcomers, we'd go around the room. We were kind of small back then, maybe 20 people. We'd go around the room and say, my name's David. I need help. Will you help me? The next person would say, I'm Mary. I need help. Will you help me? And Tommy would say, I need help. Will you help me? Why do we do that? Because we never need to forget where we come from, how much we need help. The whole solution to our recovery was we finally admitted we needed help. We finally admitted we were powerless. We turned to our higher power, so we need to always be reminded that we can't do this thing alone. However, I've got the Holy Spirit in me forever. He's a 24-7, on-call person there that takes up constant residence who's there to help me live this Christian life. What a wonderful thing right there, isn't it? Amen. We're not alone. My mama may be able to help me. My dad may be able to help me. My pastor may not be able to help me, but they'll leave me and desert me. It may not be there. I'll let myself down, but there's one person we can always count on who will always be there to help us, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Guaranteed. Number three, it says He will guide us into all truth. John 16, 13 says, But when He... So He refers to Himself as... He is the Spirit of Truth. I have a life form. I have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is, is the, he's the Spirit that lives in me that, that is of truth. How I many you know God is truth and in Him there's no darkness whatsoever. God is light. John 8, 44 says that the devil is a liar and the father of all lies. He hates the truth. His goal is to undermine the truth and deceive us and to lead us away from the truth. But John 16, 13 says that but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide us into all truth. We're in a world today where they're asking, what is truth? They're calling evil good and good evil. And, you know, I mean, it's just amazing out there today. I even watch around... around scratching my head sometimes because I get challenged on what is true and different things and man you're seeing pastors talk about crazy things and I mean you're just seeing a, a watering down of God's standard and his moral code and we're in a world today that's just so messed up and people really don't even know what truth is but the spirit of truth he tells us what is truth so when we're confused and deceived and I need to know what truth is then I can turn to the Holy Spirit and he will guide me he will navigate me through this world where people challenge me or question me or when I'm standing up and doing things and you know that spirit of truth will rise up in for, in, and he'll guide me into, into what is really true. He's our teacher. John 14, 26. It says, But the helper of the Holy Spirit, when whom the Father will send in your name, who lives inside, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance. All that I said, I said last week, how in the world did Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John able to uh, write down all the details of the life of Jesus? I mean, Jesus was gone, but you know, they four different plate, four different men wrote it, you know, four different ways and different accounts, and yet they're amazingly accurate. It's because the Holy Spirit uh, reminded them of all those things. Hey, you remember when you were on the Mount of Transfiguration and He said, you're going to do this? And they said, oh, yeah. They were walking on the road to Emmaus and they were talking about these things and Jesus showed up and started imparting to them, uh, teaching them about the truth. And, you know, they, they were their hearts were burning. And He was explaining to them the whole thing and they're going, yeah, that's how why that, oh, yeah. And yeah, and then next thing you know, He appears before them and then, you know, they're all going, how do we miss it? How do we do that? The prophets, you know, how in the world, before Jesus was ever even, they were prophesying about Jesus accurately. 
way, way, way before Jesus ever even showed up, there, there were prophecies talking about Jesus in amazing detail about different things about who Jesus was and what He was going to be. And how could they do that? It's because the Holy Spirit was teaching them things. So we have teachers, counselors, pastors, tapes, TV things, all these different things. But, but the thing we need to know is that we, we have a full-time tutor. An instructor. I, I've, you know, uh, these athletes nowadays go to college, and I don't know how in the world they ever do what they do, playing sports. But most likely, they've got a tutors to sign them 24/7 to help them take on that load. You know, I wish I would have had the opportunity to go to seminary as, as a pastor, but I never had the money or the luxury of doing that. So I've had to be self-taught. I've had to really learn to go to the Lord. And the wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit is that, man, you know, if we really want to be taught, I can listen to Pastor Dave, I can listen to this preacher and listen to these tapes, but, man, I've got the, I've got the ultimate teacher. I've got the professor. I've got the, the teacher of all teachers, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, you know, and, and all i got to do is get out the Bible and start reading it, the written Word, the Logos, and then it is, as, as I'm reading it, the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me, His job is to, is to bring the warm rainbow word, the spoken word. He, he is the interpreter, interpreter of the word. He's the one that makes it living and sharper than active than any two-edged sword. And as I sit before the Lord, He'll give me insight into what it means. He'll give me revelation. He'll give me understanding. And He's the ultimate teacher. So yeah, it's great that we have teachers, but man, the Holy Spirit is His job. One of His roles is, is to teach me about all things and to guide me into all truth. So we have these four different roles of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like the gift is in us. Inside this box, I've got, you know, you know, I've got it living it, and so all of a sudden I need some power. You know, I can look in my box, turn to the Holy Spirit. I call it turning inwardly, and He'll empower me. If I need some help, Lord, if you're there, I need some help. Where are you? Come on. Hello. 24-7. He's there to guide me into all truth. He's there to be my teacher anytime I need Him. One of the things I like to use is this, this old briefcase. This helps me kind of get a visual. You know, uh, you know we, we have a tendency to have our quiet time and we run out there ahead of the Lord. We don't take the Lord with us and it's kind of like leaving my briefcase at home. If you ever had a professional job, whatever, you have all your stuff in here. This is what helps you with the tools and the things you need during the day. And if you leave it at home, you get to the office. How are you going to be able to have the ability and function to do the things you need to do? So I look at it as like uh, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. He's a gift, but I, I like to give it as a, like a portable sanctuary. I'm going through the day, and man, I'm running out of steam. I'm running out of power, so... Let me, let me let me quit trying to do this thing on my own. Hang, hang on a second. Let me just give me a minute. Let me let me open up and you know and let me go in here and let me get some power. Let me get some dunamis. It's like Superman, Clark Kent. Excuse me a second. He runs in the phone booth and he comes out Superman and now he's got the power on him. He ain't Clark Kent no more. He's been empowered, hasn't he? So when I need power, when I need help, or don't don't run around trying to keep keep you know, stop. This is what you have the Holy Spirit for. Look in your briefcase and get some help. You need some guidance into what's going on in your life. You need some truth. Turn in and get it. You need a teacher. You need to understand, you know, go to your teacher and picture this thing as like a portable sanctuary. Everywhere you go, don't leave home without it. Amen? Amen. So let's look at a few more tonight. We're going to look at the role of the Holy Spirit part two. We're going to look at four or five more things. This is some good stuff, folks. Let me just tell you a little secret. You, you have things available to you that Christians don't even have. I can't even imagine sometimes how... You know, I, I, I imagine being married is probably a really, really hard thing is, is with the Holy Spirit. I can't imagine how people in the world do it. Yeah. You know, today I can't even imagine that I even tried to exist the way I used to exist. You know, people, people today out there in the world, they don't have joy available to us. So we're going to do maybe a whole teaching on the fruits of the Spirit. 
in the gifts of this. I've got all the fruits of the Spirit. I've got love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control at my disposal any time because of the Holy Spirit gives me those things. When I'm in patience, I can reach in and get some patience. When I need some joy, I can get some joy. When I need some love, I can get some love. When I need some peace, I can get some peace. They're all right there. And I don't know how the world does it. You have all these things that you're excess, so you have to be aware of them and you have to get out your tools and open up your box and take them with you and start using your tools. I'm trying to give you a visual to help you understand this thing. Now turn me back to John 14, 16. This is our most important scripture, I believe, in the whole Bible. Jesus says, I'll ask the Father, and He's going to give you another helper. He's going to empower you. He's going to guide you to know truth. He's going to be your teacher. He's going to help you. Whenever you need Him, He's going to be there forever. Now, listen to what the Amplified says. If you don't have an Amplified Bible, I hurry, highly encourage you to get one to read alongside. I've actually, my Bible at home is a parallel Bible. It has the New American Standard on one side and the Amplified on another side. So I'm reading here and I want some amplification. That's what an Amplified Bible does. It brings out the Greek, the richness. You, know, you hear me talk about the Greek words. That's where I get a lot of that stuff. It, it brings revelation. It, it amplifies. It brings out the richness and the, the treasures that are hidden in there. So listen to what the Amplified says. It says, I'll give you another helper that he may be with you forever. But listen to what the Amplified says. It says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter. Counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, standby. This just amplifies and brings out what a helper is. You know, a helper is somebody who helps you. How does he help you? He helps you by all these different ways. That when you're serving somebody, you can help them by giving them food. You can give them a pack rub. You can give them some money. You, you know, you're there to help. It's like there's all kinds of different ways you help. So the Holy Spirit is... First and foremost, He's our helper. And He helps us in all these different ways. So the next one let's take a look at is He's, he's our comforter. Second Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Describes God. It says, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And describes Him as the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Who comforts us in all of our afflictions. Listen to the Amplified. It says, Blessed be the God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies or sympathy. Sympathy is the word for mercy. It means to take pity or to have mercy. It means, and it says that He's the God of all mercies, the God of all sympathy, and the source of He's the source. You know, we can go, we can look to all other kinds of places to, to get a source to encourage us. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we can look to drugs to give us a source of encouragement. We can look to sex to give us a source. Uh, but here it says that He's the God of all mercies and He's the source in, to comfort us. The word means to console and encourage, to bring encouragement who comforts, consoles, and encourages us in every trouble, every calamity, and every affliction. So what it says right there when we're going through trials and troubles and calamities and afflictions, we've blown it. I'm guilty. I've you know, been eight months clean and I just blew it. I just lost my composure with this person and I went off on them and gave them my mind. Anybody ever do those things? Blow it. What it says right here when we blow it, then we can go to the God of, who lives inside of us, who's there to comfort us, to console us, to encourage us, and to provide sympathy in these different times. It's not if you go through trials and tests and things, it's, it's when. How are you going to respond? So when I'm having a bad hair day, when I'm having, I was talking to Lance, he was saying, came in the other day and said, man, talk about the evil day. He said, that was it yesterday. 
The evil day is the day the devil throws every single thing he's got at you. <clears throat> How many ever have those days? Where you just step back and say, man, it's best if I just go back to bed. I mean, the devil's got this person yelling at you, this person's yelling at you, you got this thing going inside of you. It's just one of the days where you just, you just basically say, I'm going to hang on to the tree and let this thing pass. <clears throat> well, the word sympathy is, a word, is an amazing word. It means to come alongside somebody and to help them. We know that the Good Samaritan saw the, the, the guy that had been robbed, beaten, and stripped, and left for dead. The priest passed him, and the rabbi passed him, and here this Good Samaritan that was busy, was on his way, and had an, a, an agenda for the day. He says that he stopped and got off his horse, and he got down and bandaged the guy up, took him to the hospital, said take care of him, and then Whatever more bills we have, when I come back to town, I'll settle up with you. But he took this person from where they are to where they needed to be. That's what a minister is. This don't make ministry real complicated. Ministry is taking people whose lives are a message, bringing them through a process of healing to a place where they begin to have a message. Now, when I'm trying to minister to somebody, I try to take them where they are and bring them to where they need to be in the Lord. The Lord took me at a time one time when I was in desperation. I cried out, Lord, I surrendered and God took me where I was at. He came down to my level and He showed me mercy. He didn't give me what I deserved. I'd just been out on a two-year run. Smoke and crack like it was going off the style. and I mean, I wouldn't even go into the whole thing. I, the Lord should have said, I want nothing to do with you, man. So even after I spit on Him and I did all these things and you know, I was born again. At that time, I humbled myself and I appealed to the Holy Ghost inside me, who is the God of all mercies, and He came down and showed sympathy. He didn't give me what I deserved. As a matter of fact, He came alongside me and He walked me to health. The word sympathy means to get down off your high horse, get down to their level, get into their mind, understand things from their perspective, get into their heart and what they're going through emotionally, get into their, their shoes, Walk where they've been walking and try to understand where they're at, meet them there, and then lead them to a place of health. So God's done amazing work in my life, but there's sometimes where I still blow it. And I still got to be able to humble up and go back to the Lord and say, man, I blew it, man. I lost my cool. I, you know, I just, no excuse. I just made a mess. And I need you to forgive me, Lord. I need you to go easy on me. Don't, don't. You know, I need to go fix this mess. And I made a, you know, go, go eat. Lord, let, let me show mercy to me and help me fix this thing. Show me how I can get back, you know, in right relationship. And, and God is the God of all mercy and comfort. He'll console us and encourage us in times like that. Isn't it great to know, great to know that I've always got a man that will, that, that if I turn to him, he'll, he'll say, uh, I give you mercy. One of the things I pray, you know, so often and often I just get right on the floor sometimes in the morning and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I know I'm not a sinner. I'm a saint who sometimes sins, but I like to just be humble and say, Lord, I, I need your mercy today. I don't know if I can go out there and be a pastor today. I feel like a moron today or I feel like a loser today. I, I don't know if I can even deal with this stuff. I need your mercy, Lord. I need your help. And I appeal to him. And that's, that's who He is. He says, I am the God of Walmart. You come to the right place. No need to look anywhere else. He's our counselor. Isaiah 9, 6. He's talking about Jesus, but we know they're all triune. His name, Jesus, He'll be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Isn't it neat that He refers to Him as a wonderful, wonderful counselor? How many have ever been to a bummer of a counselor before? Mm -hmm. You wasted your money. Yeah. Man, we got a wonderful counselor. He's a perfect counselor. And He's perfectly wise. Proverbs 11, 14 says that there's wisdom in an abundance of counselors. There's nothing wrong with going to counselors and getting feedback and opinion, but ultimately the final decision maker, the ultimate counselor needs to be the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me. He'll counsel me. 
He'll take what was said to me at the counseling appointment and bring affirmation to it and confirmation to it and give me perfect counsel. There's people today that pay thousands of dollars to go to shrinks and psychics and fortune tellers and you know, and they say it's a billion billion dollar industry. And you know, they're getting counsel. It may be good counsel, it may not be counsel, who knows? But but we've got the perfect counselor, and all I gotta do is when I need some counsel is go to my suitcase, open it up, and set up an appointment, go into God's personal chamber, into his little office, and lay on the couch and tell him what's going down. You've seen my little diagram here, you know. Uh, okay, I've got a problem. I need some wisdom, and you know I can run over here to my intellect. What would Jesus do? I can run to Pastor Dave or Jackie or run down to there or there, there, and I can get counsel and do these different things. And we have a habit of of. Uh, when we're perplexed and we don't know what to do, we need counsel, we need wisdom, we go over here, we try to figure it out, and then we, then we go back to God, don't we? Yeah. All right, Lord, this is okay. i got to figure it out. Now, now I'm going to tell you how we're going to do this. And we're giving God counsel. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think I'm one to give the, I mean, you know, the, the right kind, I mean, the perfect kind of counsel, especially what I used to. Today, hopefully, I can a little bit. But what it says right here, James 1.5 says, if you need wisdom... Go ask Pastor Dave. That's not what it says. Nothing wrong with asking Pastor Dave. Well, well, if you need wisdom, you know, pick up the phone and make an appointment and spend five hundred dollars for two hours at the counselor or call the psychic hotline. No, you know, it says if you need wisdom, ask him. <coughs> He's got plenty of it. It means he gives it without reproach. He that means he's sitting there with plenty of wisdom and he's ready to lavish his wisdom on you. It's not just wisdom, but it's a perfect wisdom. And it don't cost you nothing. And you don't have to make an appointment. It's 24-7. Anytime you can go in and get perfect counsel from the Lord. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He's our strengthener. Isaiah 40, 28. We've been talking about this some. It says, Do you not know? Do you not recognize? Have you not perceived? Have you not fully understood? Have you not become educated? Haven't you learned yet? Have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord that created the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength might, ability to the weary and to him who lacks might or the ability to deal with things he increases in power now that's not, that's a Hebrew word so it's not our word deutimus but it basically works the same way how many of you ever get kind of wore out tired you know you just don't have it in you I mean, there's so many times, man, where I've been preaching and teaching and going on and day after day, month after month, year after Sometimes I just get where I just like, Lord, I just don't have it today. I need some, I need an infusion. Yeah. You know, I need to be energized. I need to be motivated. I need some passion. I just don't have it in me. I'm letting go. Lord, you're calling me to go preach today or to go teach, man. I just, I don't have nothing. I'm out. It's at that moment I can run to my source. I can turn inward to the Holy Spirit. I can take my jumper cables and I can go in and I can tap on the 23,000 volts of dynamite due to this holy power. I don't have to be like Popeye and sit around and get beat up by Blue Doe. I can run, grab hold of my source, my spinach, and drink my deutimus. And next thing I know, Muscles start popping up, energy starts popping up, and now all of a sudden I've been infused with the very life of God, and now I can go do the same. He did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Trust me, you're human. You're, there's going to be many, many times where you're just not going to be able to be up to it. It's 
much as you want to try to be religious and spiritual, there's going to be times where you're just going to feel flat out worldly and fleshly, and, and you're going to need to be able to turn inward to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, I need, I need an infusion. It says that He's our standby. I thought this was kind of a weird one. Some of you may have a job where you know they, you're like really, really important, and it's your day off, and they say, okay, but uh, you know you can go home and enjoy yourself, but you're on call. I mean, kind of like, what kind of day off is that? Yeah. You can go fishing or whatever, but we expect you to get that boat back real fast and get the boat cleaned up and get back to the office. You know, you're on call. But I got to think that's uh, you know what a, a standby kind of is. Psalms 124 says, "Behold, He talks about who keeps Israel. God will never sleep nor slumber." Psalms 127 two says that He gives to His beloved even in their sleep. Well, you're snoring away at night. The Lord's sitting here right next to you. He's your wingman. He's your armor bearer. He's there to serve. He never leaves you, deserts you, or forsakes you. He's on call 24 7. While you're snoring away, he's awake thinking of ways to give to his beloved. Isn't that an amazing thing? He's sitting around, this is my beloved, and he watches over us. He's, he's my standby. He's on call. Kind of like the WWF tag team. Jump all out there and you do your thing and you know, by the time you run out of a little steam, you, you reach back and you tap your boy and you step out and he jumps in and takes over. Get out of my way. He jumps in there and he stands in the gap for you. And takes over. You know? So anytime I'm, you know, I'm on a, our job is to get out there. We, 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 Jesus is not going to do things for us. The Holy Spirit's not going to do it for We have to do our part. We have to get out there and go to work, make things happen, read the Bible, study, show ourselves approved. We have to do all these things. But at the same time, I've got someone standing by that can jump in and provide aid. Come alongside me who never sleeps, never slumbers, who's there 24-7. Amen? Amen? All right. Well, let's stop right there. I've got four more for next week and then a few more coming down the road. So next week will be... Roll the Holy Spirit part three. Amen. Amen. Amen.